Righto, ladies and gents. Today we have a long-awaited appointment with the good people at Asprey of Bond Street. Oh. Asprey? You must be joking. Ce n'est pas possible. This is a 90s, mon ami. Have you seen the security they have there now? I have seen the security, yes, and it is this very security that makes me think Asprey is a red-hot go. How do you mean? Well, they think their terribly expensive security makes them invulnerable, and that makes them complacent. So, the plan? Philippe, when have you ever known me to have a plan? <laughs> the only plan is teamwork, and teamwork is the only plan. Right, all you mugs got to do is pull the heads until I get a tickle in my throat and start coughing, and me and my little key will do the rest. But... Hey, I don't want to hear your doubts. You're either in, or you can read about it in the paper tomorrow, OK? Yes, King. You in? Yes, King. Good. Now, Philippe, you'll be with me today. Welcome to Asprey, gentlemen. Thank you. Pleasure to be back. The Tom's in a case in the back corner of the mezzanine. Now, Karen, you and Paul can team up today. Colonel, if you wouldn't mind terribly being infatuated with young Fiona here, you can buy me a drink later. <laughs> staff? Uh, there should be five staff, but with any luck, two will be on a lunch break. Now, Tex, if you wouldn't mind going general cover for us today. There is a floor manager in an office under the stairs. If he comes out, you know what to do. Now, if things get too tight, just Uncle Tomius and we can all scatter like pollen. <laughs> do have a lovely day, ladies. Welcome to Asprey, gentlemen. Thank you. Pleasure to be back. It's been such a long time. Do enjoy yourselves. What seems to be the trouble? Uh, it is uh, losing time, inexplicably. One minute per hour. Incredible, I know if I watch at this value, but uh, that is the case. Well, it's highly unusual for one of our watches, sir. Uh, if you'll excuse me for one moment, I'll just bring the watchmaker down to have a look at it, sir. Oh, and I'd like to see the new range also. That one is so outdated. He really needs a new one. Oh, I just love the sweet in diamonds. At 50,000 pounds, of course you do. I dare say they would look splendid on you. Would you mind awfully amusing yourself for a while? <laughs> How may I help you, sir? I'm looking for something very special for her uh, that hits just the right note. But of course, discretion is, is extremely important. Of course. Welcome to Asprey, gentlemen. How may we help you today? We're just browsing, thank you. We can help ourselves. Very good, sir. Only the most brilliant thief would dare to help himself at Asprey of Bond Street, the jeweler to Her Majesty the Queen. Was it destiny or sheer folly that led one man to this moment? We shall see. But first, we should start at the beginning. From 1788, Britain had sent its best thieves across the world to Australia. In the 1960s, some made it home. There were five master thieves, the King, the Fibber, the General, Wee Jimmy, and the dashing Georgie Gardner. Together with their mob, they tore up London in broad daylight and became known as the Kangaroo Gang. Thieves by appointment. They came with a kind of flying panache. You know, they were the light horsemen of thieves. They were a breath of fresh air, actually. A funny thing to say, but they were. They were adventurers, they were buccaneers. Well, they were the best. They, they proved themselves to be the, the best shoplifters in, in the world. These bikes weren't just shoplifters. This was Ocean's Eleven stuff. They would take anything that wasn't nailed down. They'd go to stores and take everything in the store. Only they were capable of this really high-class theft from high-class shops. You know, not just take one item, maybe just ten in one heap. How they used to do it, I don't know. They were thieves, they, were, they dealt in diamonds, they dealt in money, and they dealt in guile and trickery. I mean, the only people that suffered with it was, was insurance companies. I mean, I mean, let's face it, that's almost legal, isn't it? 
London in the 1960s was at the center of a global revolution in fashion, music and culture. Australians flocked to this swinging scene. With artists, writers and actors, there came a bunch of thieves who would become the kangaroo gang. Uh, there's a, a team of uh, Australians who are very professional shoplifters and uh, they're going to shops and one of them will distract the assistant's attention while a second will uh, empty anything they get their hands off into large cases, bags and things. This will be passed even to a third person and then the two people come together again, speak to the assistant and the assistant's suspicions are not aroused in any way. Australian police knew exactly who Scotland Yard were after. Everybody was laughing about it. All these shit kickers that were kicked out of Melbourne and Sydney had gone overseas and made millions. And here we are still getting the same wages every week and they're living in the top hotels and dealing in diamonds and caviar and mixing with the gentry in England. They were mastering all these little techniques. They were, they were, they were, they were taking things from Australia that really hadn't been seen in, in England. There was a sort of a, a confidence they were bringing there that we can try anything here, because uh, it's as if they, they've forgotten how good we are. They, they've sent us out here as convicts 150 years earlier, and we're back and we've got a bag of tricks that these fellows haven't even seen. They, they were modern day raffles, and uh, because they used no violence, because they kept a low level, we didn't pay them the attention that they really that really merited. And they got away with a lot, no doubt at all about that. You know, I mean, let's face it, all that ever went out there years ago was the prison ships, wasn't it? And so everybody could get a bit confused, couldn't they? I mean, when you look back in history, England made them leave by boat, their forefathers, and they came back by aeroplane and slaughtered Knightsbridge and Bond Street. So I would say, out of all the criminals that I met in the past, they was elite. I don't know whether it's something we should be proud of, but it would certainly be seen. I think that certainly in the 60s and 70s, across in, in London and Europe, we certainly made our mark over there and, and uh, to agree became uh, probably sort of, um, I don't know, almost heroes in some respects about the way we approached it. At first, the English police had little idea what was going on. A few likely lads had turned up in 1962 and set about teaching the local crooks a thing or two about the art of thieving. But within a few years, the kangaroo gang had become 100 strong, a highly skilled mercenary army working for five master takers. Well, they were, they were working below the radar mostly. Uh, they were doing things the English crooks weren't doing. And uh, also, I mean, these guys had a charis charisma about them. The bank robbers in those days were putting trucks through the windows, reversing a truck into a window, and then they'd try and pick the diamonds out of the window. Where well, the Australian gangs found out the alternative way was to go into the shop, make all the distractions that they could possibly, and relieve the jewellery without any problems. It was a complicated system, but it worked and worked and worked. Teams had specific roles in them, almost like a, a football team had specific uh, positions and, and skills that went with those positions. Now, Karen, you and Paul can team up today. Colonel, if you wouldn't mind terribly being infatuated with young Fiona here, you can buy me a drink later. <laughs> Everybody would have to be well-dressed, different clothes, different look, if possible, different accents. Uh, Tex, if you wouldn't mind going general cover for us today. Phew! <laughs> it's getting warm in here. It is uh, losing time. Inexplicably, one minute per hour. I mean, it was always um, based around the taker. He was the general. Then you'd have your head pullers, who were, it was all about getting the, the staff to look a certain direction for a certain amount of time. He really needs a new one. OK. <laughs> you and my wife, if you will. To get everybody in position was uh, it was a simple casting of your tie. If you turned with the, your right hand, you needed him pulled to the right a little bit further. If it was the left, and, and, and so on. Just obvious, silly little things that, that, that made a lot of sense. Um, there might be blocking where a larger guy would uh, essentially provide a, uh, a screen, like in football, essentially, to allow the, uh, the taker to move unseen into the store. And then, of course, the other signals, you know, put your hand on your head, rub your hand through, everything's all right, keep going. But the minute anyone touched their coat twice, that was an emergency to, to exit the premises immediately. 
Most of the people involved in, in, in head pulling, distracting, blocking and so forth were shoplifters back in Australia, but um, few had the confidence and the dash to be a successful taker because he was the one that all the pressure was on. Then there was the idea that you had to get everybody into the shop, then the taker had to do his work. At that, that's where it was the difficult part, to get over the counter, behind the counter, into the window or into the back of the office. And then it came who was going to leave first, not a rush of stampede for the door, but who would leave first. So that was always signalled in, in the variations of signals, mainly coughs. <coughs> so <clears throat> the first cough would come from the taker, that everything's cool, that the price has been secured, and that the first couple can leave the shop. Audrey? Oh. Oh. So if you were working with a team of six or seven handed and they were couples and whatnot, it was a matter of getting out nice and slowly and, and everybody out. I do, do recall one particular time in, in, in a place called Baden-Baden and we were all ready to, to go to work and there was a particular chap with us who, who's, who came from Leichhardt, from our area, called the Bush Ranger, a useless individual, but we took him on this particular job. And everybody was ready for the cough or for the collar or, or all of the slow signals. And for some unknown reason, in the middle of the operation, the Bush Ranger sneezed. Achoo! Well, it was, it was diabolical because nobody knew what to do. Everybody looking at each other, what do we do? We stay, we go, that's a new signal. For much of the 1960s, the Australians operated virtually undetected, artfully stealing millions of pounds in jewels and luxury goods from London's finest retailers. Well, Fibs on, mate. Here's to another day in Oyster's Paradise. You betcha. If only those blokes back in Sydney could see us now. <laughs> in Australia, these villains had become too well known. There were so few high-end stores to rob and only so many police who would take a bribe. London offered them a chance to start again. New faces on a much bigger stage. Well, we had good liaison with all the stores, so... We gave them all the photographs, anything they wanted, we, we, we gave them and we, we cooperated with each other and uh, they seemed to be fairly proficient in catching them. And maybe that's by the reason that they might have decided to uh, piss off and go over to, to London to start with and uh, where it was much bigger and their chances of becoming known would take a lot longer time. Some of our key figures who'd been involved in ordinary crime were expanding overseas or going overseas, especially to London, and running uh, shoplifting gangs and coming back boasting about it, and they were, they were held in high regard. They came up through the school of hard knocks, and a lot of them started their careers as, uh, you know, rip-roaring around the streets doing their best, graduated to thieving from the wharves, then found that they could, um, shoplifting was a more profitable and uh, an easier lifestyle for them. The shoplifters became gentrified. Uh, they uh, spoke with a different accent, the average Aussie. They addressed well. Because the store detectives were looking for knockabouts, they weren't looking for people with uh, most probably a small rose in their lapel and, uh, and uh, a several rose suit and uh, well-polished shoes. So they escaped the attention of the uh, store detective for some time. These Aussie shoplifters, known in the underworld as hoisters, arrived in London before the days of closed circuit television, electronic tags and vigilant in-store security. It was a far off time when retailers trusted their customers. You know, the technology certainly wasn't around in those days, so, you know, you put aside CCTV. It was just wide open. So depending on the capacity and the capabilities of yourself, you picked where you wanted to work. But when they got to England, they were good at what they did and they couldn't believe it, as they told me, that everything was so available to steal. What you had were uh, members of the kangaroo gangs uh, going back and forward to Australia. They'd come for a few months, make some money, go home, and they would be the Champagne Charlies. They'd be all over Sydney and Melbourne, um, you know, sp spreading their money around, saying, it's, oh, you've got to go to England, it's the best thing you'll ever, you'll ever do, it's, uh, it's El Dorado, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Luna Park, it's the Royal Easter Show, you've got to get there, mate. Baby Bruce Stanton was one amongst hundreds of Aussie thieves to make the journey in the 60s and 70s. Each had his own speciality, and Bruce's was picking pockets. Third floor, haberdashery, furniture, Manchester, hobbies, electrical appliances. Oh, excuse me, I'm so sorry. Did you say lady 
lady's shoes were on this floor? Oh, no, that lady's shoes are on the next floor down. OK, I'll wait. Thank you. Going down? I come from Leichhardt, which is the best way to answer this. And now here I am from Leichhardt. I, I mean, not in, in Sydney, I'm in London. I'm with the best people in Knightsbridge. I'm shopping at Harrods. I live in Lennox Gardens. I'm laughing. I'm top of the world. How can I be here? I could never believe how I'd come off from Leichhardt to where I was in, in a couple of years. In London, Bruce didn't join the Australians in the Kangaroo Gang. He took his pickpocketing skills to the underground, known amongst thieves as King Solomon's Mines, where he joined the English pickpocketing gangs. Here we are, Lower Region Street, Piccadilly Tube Station. And this is really the entrance to King Solomon's Mines. Once you're down in the mines, you can go in many directions. Central Line, Piccadilly Line, but it is a different world down there. I hope it's off to work we go. Bruce worked the underground tube lines daily with the English pickpocketing gangs, who are known as the bottle firms. Well, here we are in front of the old Whiteley store. This was really the home away from home for all the Australians who came here. But the main area for coming here because of its safety. Here we could get an apartment quite easily without the right identification. A gentleman that lives very close nearby by the name of Mr. Davy Barry, he was always there to assist the Australians and he was always there. Whenever there was a problem, he could get them out of problems. By the mid-1960s, Dave Barry, the governor of Queensway, was greeting dozens of Aussie thieves, landing each month to join the fun. I had a circle of friends and this and that, and uh, lots of them Australians, and uh, if somebody was on their way over and under an assumed name, they'd say, um, so and so, can I get hold of this one? Can I get hold of that one? I'd say, well, give me a number and I'll get somebody to give you a call. I used to get flats for them, but I used to get commission off the agents, didn't I? <laughs> you knew people, it was quite big in the criminal fraternity. Not maybe as a fully active criminal, you know, going out, not robberies, that bit. He was a receiver of goods, he could place them, he could get the money, and it kept him away from the receiver. Without him, it would not have operated so smoothly, frankly speaking. It wasn't easy to come from Australia on your own and, and, and find your own way around. With Dave, you always knew you had the facility to get a bed, to get a house, to get an apartment, and to get yourself moving. No, it's a long way to come. But the 60s and the 70s, it was quite easy here. There was loads of people, loads of women, the pubs were all flying, everything was good. It was home away from home, Queensway. English criminals are always going to know which police are going to be helpful and how to get into them. And obviously, you, you've got to have an introduction. Uh, and just the same as you've got to have an introduction to find flats and things like that, and introductions to, initially, uh, which shops are, which are going to have security systems which aren't. Dave Barry was the main fence to the Aussies, receiving and selling their plunder. He also had crucial connections with corrupt police, known as the sugar bags, who for a fee would turn a blind eye. Well, you used to get your card marks, say, don't be here, don't be there, it's a, it's a ready eye. Things like that, you know, which saved a lot of people from going in the can. The only stipulation was that there could be no violence. That's right, no violence, because the sugar bags wouldn't entertain you if you was at the violence game. They let you get away with most things, but anything, any violence, no, they put a stop to it. With a friendly policeman or two on side, there was nothing the Aussie hoisters wouldn't attempt. Here was the creme de la creme. You had the Cartiers, you had the Kajinskis, you had the Mappen and Webbs, you had the Watches of Switzerland, you had famous Aspreys. They were all, all, all there together. They, at that time, were way out of my depth. All I could do was look in amazement of, of what was in the window. But baby Bruce's time would come, learning the trade from our master thieves. The number one taker and king of the thieves was Arthur Delaney. He was the superstar, and a team of more than 100 thieves vied to work with him. His training ground had been the Sydney department stores of the 1950s. I'm not sure if it's going to be big enough for my brother. He's a big man. Do you have one in a slightly larger size? Uh, I think so. I'll just see if we've got one in stock. Oh, 
I don't think we've got one of those. Well, while you're up there, would you check to see if that houndstooth one comes in a larger size? Sure. Well, Delaney's Interpol uh, nickname was King Arthur, and he was the king of the crew. Uh, smooth as an oil deal, and he was a real piece of work, Arthur Delaney. He was a remarkable, remarkable thief. But Arthur had the techniques of, of being a master thief in many, many ways. He knew where to stand in a shop when entered the shop. He knew where to slip under the counter. He knew where to go over the top of the counter. He knew where the keys were. He knew how to pickpocket. He, Arthur, was brilliant at everything. Arthur was a great uh, student of, of human uh, behaviour and interaction. And he worked out how the English reacted to people and, and, and the sort of the, the, the hot points and the way to deal with people. And, and he was actually a master at it. And that was one of his great successes was just blending in or, or, or getting people to trust him on the basis that he had the same mannerism, mannerisms and behaviour as they did, the same customs. So that's very useful. Oh, Arthur thought he was this and everybody else. Good luck to him. He, he called himself the king at one stage. <laughs> <laughs> King Arthur invented 3D. People think that uh, 3D would come from Disneyland. King Arthur invented that deception, disguise and distraction. Well, you know, Arthur came to England as the Duke and now that he was in, the, in, the, in, in England in the place of royalty, he wanted to be a king as well. He did say to me sometimes, did you read the paper today? Was that you? He'd read about Raffles, the, uh, the the English burglar, you know, the fictional English burglar who was who played cricket for the gentlemen of England and and uh, uh, impeccable manners and belonged to the right the Albany Club and all this sort of thing. So Arthur modelled himself uh, on this Raffles character. He was the shiny, glossy, turned out gentleman, and that's that was a huge advantage. Arthur was a big time operator, and that, that's where the name the King came from. Yes, King. You in? Yes, King. Very, very sophisticated and very, very good people working with him. But unlike the other teams, Arthur would have mercenaries come in and out. He would hire people for the day for like it was an acting guild. The only plan is teamwork, and teamwork yeah, is the yeah. only plan. No, he, he just used to love it. He just gets really excited when he got away with something big. Got really excited like, um, like a kid. I'm the best. I'm the king. Didn't even know we were in the shop. Didn't even know I was there. But King Arthur was a character of his own creation. Not always a dashing thief. He was once a truck driver with a young family in Newcastle, north of Sydney. Um, they were married at... S he was 18, Mum was 17, and they had Colin in 1945. And then I was born in 46. Um, the police came looking for him, so he must have done something wrong then, and he just disappeared. Delaney left a string of children and their broken-hearted mothers across Australia, including Rosina da Costa, who only found out who her father was after his death. Uh, the year 2001, when my birth mother confessed to me that Arthur William Delaney was my father. Arthur was her first love, of course, and uh, she used to always say that he was drop-dead gorgeous and she was totally in love with him. Uh, the last time she heard of him was when he did a jury heist in Denmark with the Kangaroo Gang. When Arthur landed in London in 1962, he was one of the best money getters ever seen. And with the spoils came an endless procession of women. Because every photograph I've got is with a different woman. Every single one. He was a handsome looking bloke. He's only a little bloke. He might have been about an inch bigger than me, but the women loved him. Arthur was a womanizer. He really loved women. No, he'd say, I'm you're my fountain of youth and you're my little drop of morning dew. That's it. He was such a honey tongue. I've never seen anyone more beautiful than you. He was the man, Arthur, you know. If you had a, if you had two girls, well, they both want Arthur. You might miss out all together, you know what I mean? I mean, there were just a string of women in Arthur's life, and, and I think uh, they would, um, you know, a lot would wait for him in vain, I'm afraid. Every king must have his jester, so Jack William Warren, a.k.a. the Fibber, followed his great mate Arthur to the UK. But before meeting the king and becoming a jewel thief, 
The Fibber worked a lot of scams. His favorite was playing the popular game of two up with dodgy two-headed coins. Come on, that's four in a row. Hand the kip over to somebody else. Give us some luck. Oh, come on, fellas, get behind me. What's wrong with you? I'm willing to put my shirt on this next one. Being a I'm serious. <laughs> Looks like a matey chihuahua. I'll give you two bob. <laughs> well, you're a beautiful man, but you can shove your two bob where the sun don't shine. Oh. I'm not backing you, you bald prick. Twenty on tails. Well, I'll have fifty on tails. Yeah. Come, oh. Come on, mate, head him up. Yeah, it's uh, about two hundred on tails. I oh, know. I'm going to put two hundred. On heads. Right on, mate. Head him up. Come on. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. 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 Give us a look at those coins. Oh, there's nothing fishy. I won that fair and square. You don't need to see nothing, mate. You bet on tails and you lost. So did I. Now get out of here while you're still in one piece. Yeah, I'd, be, I'd just be uh, in amongst the crowd, you know, unobtrusive. But uh, you keep in your eye on things if there was ever any trouble, you know, you'd, uh, you'd handle it as uh, diplomatically as possible. Billy Longley, a.k.a. the Texan and the Fibber, made an unlikely pair. The Fibber hated violence, and Billy Longley was the most feared gunman and enforcer on Melbourne's bloody waterfront. Yeah, well, I, I was a good shot, there's no doubt about that. And there's only one way you learn to be a good shot, and that is by practice, you know. No, I don't recall missing, no, I do not. No. Now get out of here while you're still in one piece. There's always one in every crowd. <laughs> well, now, you poor mugs. You had your chance. Me and the Chihuahua are going home. Yeah, going up. Up. Yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, going up. Right, who's up? Come on, let's go. Come on, let's go. 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 And he'd get close to you, you know, he'd lean over and look at look you right in the eyes. Very persuasive bloke. They said that Fibber, when he was home, would walk down to the beach and he'd be walking and he'd be kicking sand over people's watches and, and you know, stopping and tossing a bit of sand over a pair of sunglasses and marking the spot so he could come back later on just to have a little collection on the beach just to keep himself going. Jack was full of laughter. Jack was a fun guy. Jack wanted to enjoy it. Jack wanted everybody to be happy. And his team, were, were, again, were very, very well supervised and a go happy type of team. He was, was a very lovely man, if ever. He was a, a spender in a very, very big way. He would go out in the restaurants, nobody else could pick up a bill. It would always be the Fibber would pay for everything. Whether they went on the trip or holiday, Fibber was always there to pay the bills. He, he, he was a big earner, so he was a big spender. I was with him one day and we had safe breaking stuff in the glove box of the car and we were headed up to attack this safe. And the coppers drove past us and wanted us to pull over. Oh, Jesus, I'm saying to myself, I could see five years, you know with what we had in the glove box, gel ignite and things like that. And the liar said, leave this to me. And he got out the car and ran, ran up to the police car and had his head in the window. And, uh, and he came back and he said, I fixed that up. And I thought to myself, how the bloody hell would you fix that up? The Fibber uh, was, was really a master of disguise too. He used his, uh, his dentures and his wig as a, as a real tool of trade, you know, and he used to say that uh, if you pull a big job and you've got any, any fear that people are chasing you, you get to the corner, whip your wig off, pull your teeth out, you know, look like a, you know, you're reading a newspaper and if you get to the corner, you're another person. The first night I met Fibber was at the Rushcutters Bay Hotel and um, Fibber said to me, 
He walked in the laundromat next door. He said, I've just got to pick something up. So we go in there and uh, the dryer's going round and round. And he opened the dryer and he took out his wig and put it on his head. He just washed it in the laundromat, put it in the dryer, went back for a beer, came back. The wig was all nice and fluffed up from being in the dryer. He just stuck it on his head. <laughs> The third great taker of the group was Sydney-born William Wee Jimmy Lloyd, who'd been a mentor to Arthur Delaney. But unlike the King, Wee Jimmy preferred maintaining a low profile. For that, he needed a bent cop or two. So, that's all I know, Terry. Oh, come on, Jimmy. I knew more than that when I came in here. No flies on you, are they? Sorry I can't be of any more help. Well, maybe I can. Go on. How you getting home? Taxi, why? It's cold out there, you don't have a coat. Yes, I do. You'll be wanting something warmer than that. Oh, I got a lovely camel hair upstairs. Fresh from DJ's. The price tag's still on. How much? Tell you what, why don't you buy it from me with this? Better still, keep the charge. I know that he had a lot of pull with old Bill all over the world, not only in New South Wales, but in Melbourne and other places as well. Australians were recognised as the best shoplifters in the world and the, uh, the pommy coppers knew this, you know, and they, they knew they could, uh, they could get a good living looking after the Australian shoplifters, you know, making sure if things were sweet. Wee Jimmy was a veteran pickpocket on the racetracks of Sydney and Melbourne. And it was there he learnt the secret of all successful thieves. The ability to be able to act quickly in spontaneous to know whether this was on or off or could it really, really happen. He knew when to go and when to stop in, in regards to a job. So being agile with his fingers and agile with his eyes, no, that was a big important part of the fact. Well, Jimmy's just an audacious little bugger. He's uh, had more front than Myers and uh, he was a, uh, just a cheeky, audacious shoplifter. But he was a brilliant organiser. He was a brilliant thief and he was game as fuck. In England, Wee Jimmy took his skills to a new level, where once he emptied pockets, now he emptied entire stores. He was wanted for a job at Watches of Switzerland in Knightsbridge. And I think what they basically did was, at a weekend, they put a hoarding round the shop. They then closed it off for pedestrians with a walkway round it, sorry for the inconvenience, etc. And behind the hoarding, they took the window out and emptied the shop. But he was a continuous worker, whether it was suits or whether it was tyres or whether it was bottles of wine or whether it was souvenirs or whether it was jumping behind the bank counter to relieve them of their TCs. This was just a normal routine day. So Jimmy wasn't one of those people who would plan a big robbery and do nothing the next day. No, he'd do something one day and, and again tomorrow morning he'd be up with the same team looking for another little bit of work, yes. Our next master taker, William Herbert Hill, a.k.a. The General, had found himself a regular guest of Her Majesty's prisons in Australia. He had an insatiable appetite for the finest suits of the stolen variety. He was the, a turnover man. It was the shirts and the sheets and the golf balls and the, and the, the fashion items and things that, you know, that he continued to hoist consistently, and he was very, very good at it. So it wasn't as glamorous. It didn't get him the, um, the accolades that the, uh, the jewel thieves like Arthur got or, or, or the Fibber, um, but he just worked relentlessly. And, uh, and so he actually amassed some money in the end. Oh, he was, he was well-known uh, 
shoplifter. That's the wrong word. Uh, a prolific thief. That's maybe the bit. I mean, when you say shoplifter, you think of the old dear going in and taking a bottle of milk and stuff. There was nothing like that. This was planned, organised crime. He was a legend shoplifter, Billy Hill. And, and, and well-liked, but again, a low-profile guy who tried his best to stay under the radar. There was a picture that was, that was actually stolen from his flat by one of the police that I interviewed, and, and there's Billy Hill. The clock on the wall says five past nine, and there's Billy with his, with his bowler hat and the rolled-up newspaper in the impeccable Savile Row suit. He's ready for work. People wanted to work with the general. Um, he wasn't seen in that sort of flamboyant, um, uh, you know, extroverted way that Arthur was, but he was a very, very effective thief. And uh, he was also very good at blending in. He used to like to do his own thing, Bill. He, he was a bit secretive, but he liked to do that anyway. But uh, he was training his own gang. <laughs> One policeman tells a story about um, at the height of the, of the thieving there, they're driving down um, Knightsbridge, and there is Billy Hill in the window of Harrods stripping a shop dummy of clothes. You know, and they, they didn't even bother to stop us at all. We'll get him eventually, but it was just this how brazen it became. He'd have them out working. Like, as soon as the bank's open, half past nine, ten o'clock, he'd have them out. Don't finish till three, that's when the bank's shut then, as a rule. <laughs> the final taker was George Gardner from Melbourne, who had a long list of convictions for larceny, robbery and assault. At 27, he was the youngest and the most reckless of the gang. A ladies' man and a bon vivant, they didn't call him Gorgeous Georgie for nothing. And he was game for anything. Georgie Gardner, who was a, a very celebrated uh, burglar and, and uh, thief, uh, pickpocket, you name it, Georgie did it. George Gardner had a lot of dash. George was an extremely good looking young fellow, and uh, you might say uh, he was well groomed. He, he took great care of his uh, appearance. His hair was always cut, his clothes were always flashed. He was a, a more rough and ready character, very good looking man, looked like Rock Hudson, very dashing man, and a great man with the ladies back at home, and he left kids everywhere, as many of these thieves did. But uh, he was accused of a couple of murders down in Melbourne, so he got a bit too tropical, so George Gardner goes to England. <laughs> yes, yes, we have arrived, the party can start! <laughs> By the mid-60s, London was under siege from violent crime. The press carried sensational stories of spectacular heists. In 1963, the great train robbers had become world famous. Meanwhile, violent teams of bandits were running amok in the streets. They provided the perfect distraction for the kangaroo gang. When I was first there, the English had run in, side, uh, Baseball bats, shetties, anything. Break everything in there. Everybody be bloody, you know, terrified. They go in, they scoop it all up out of the cupboards and uh, jump in the car and away they'd go. Robbery was the big thing in London at that time. It seemed every person in the villainous world was going in to bank shotguns and, and then just tearing the place apart. Compare this to the kangaroo gang, who literally charmed their way to riches. Welcome to Asprey, gentlemen. Thank you. Pleasure to be back. It's been such a long time. Do enjoy yourselves. The fibber was the brains behind one of their most masterful jobs. A tray of diamond rings disappeared from the exclusive Bensons of Bond Street. The plan called for a broken clock and a big bouquet of flowers. 
I do so hope you can fix it for us. This clock has been in the family for, um, simply ages. That's strange. There appears to be several parts missing, the counterweight for starters, and several pieces of the mechanism. Well, he did drop the blessed thing, getting it into the car. I said, be careful. As always, you are rushing me, my dear. Perhaps some of the parts you're talking about have fallen behind the seat. Or... Could you describe them to me, and then I can uh, go and have a look for them? Well, there's a cog. That's... If you don't mind, while you two tinker with that, might I have a look at some of the lovely brooches over here? Yes, of course. Victoria, would you please show Madame our selection? Of course. What can I help you with? Oh, I see. I yes. Okay. These brooches here? Yes. Oh, I I'll be right with you in a moment. Please feel free to browse. That's perfectly fine. It's my birthday and I've set aside the entire afternoon for shopping. Grace O'Connor, a formidable thief in her own right, was a key member of the Fibbers team. Lady Grace, as she was known, was the last person security would suspect of thieving. She had a ton of charisma. She was very engaging. She wore good gear. Uh, she looked good. She knew how to put a makeup on, her hair done and everything. Yeah, she's quite a charming person. What a simply darling little shop you have here. <laughs> yeah, mate. Take your time. My wallet could sure use a rest. Oh, but, Uncle, I do have to be on the train back to Cambridge at 4pm. Plenty of time for that, my little lord. Would you show me that clock over there? I see the one down at the very back at the bottom down there. Thank you, dear. Yes, right down at the back of the tray. Jack, I really do like that one there. The one with the little jade heart. Don't you want to please me on my birthday? Of course I do, my love, but... It seems like every day is your birthday. Well, it's only a few hundred pounds. <laughs> oh, 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 good oh. heavens above, what oh. have I done? Oh, dear. <coughs> Uncle Jack, I'm going back to the hotel to get my luggage. Can I meet you at the station? I mean, I just feel like I'm running out of time. Oh, well, if you must, kid. On you go. We'll just stay here and browse. Can I leave the clock with you while I go and look for those parts in the car? That would be about ten minutes. Very well, sir. Audrey? Now, may I help you, sir? You know what? I think it's time for a drink. What do you think, love? Yes, let's. Thanks. To most police, this was just another case of shoplifting. They were too busy chasing violent armed robbers to give it much thought. But jobs like Benson's were going off almost every week, arousing the curiosity of a bobby who was to become the kangaroo gang's nemesis. I think the first incident I ever went to was uh, Bond Street. Uh, there was a jeweler's there called Benson's of Bond Street, which was a very uh, high-class jeweler's. And a team of people in there, allegedly with Australian accents, had managed to take a whole tray of rings from a showcase. It was a great robbery because um, Grace walks in with a great big bunch of flowers, which is, uh, looks lovely, and it's, uh, and it, oh, even smiles at one with nice flowers and so forth. And, but it's also, it serves two purposes. It, it provides a block or a smother from people who might be looking at what they're doing, but it also contained a pair of bolt cutters. In the majority of times, the bolt cutters were long, and you had to cut the arms and make them short enough. It made it a little bit harder. To, to get the lock off, but if it was a thin lock, then it would chip off easy, and just, just like a pin. The gang got away undetected in broad daylight, right under the noses of the shop assistants. It wasn't until late in the afternoon when another customer came through the door that the draft caused the door of the showcase to flap, and then they realised it was open, otherwise they hadn't noticed it. 
Pierce goes down there and and uh, and the the staff were mystified. How had this happened? There were, there were these nice Australian oh, Australians, really, really. We we're getting some reports about Australians. Is it true? Are Australians the best con men? They're amongst uh, the best, yes. Just amongst the best. We're not out ahead. Not way ahead, <laughs> but pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Why is this? Why do they make such good con men? Well, they've got the uh, attributes of the con man, in particular this uh, real uh, wide open, suntanned Australian face that uh, wins confidence. Yeah, take your time, mate. My wallet could sure use a rest. So Mike starts to put it, put it together. It's, it's not just random acts of theft going on. It this could be a, an organised ring that is targeting the West End. And that really started to prove the point that uh, we weren't dealing with the average local, if you like. We were dealing with something a little bit more sophisticated. You know, these people were taking property on a grand scale. We've lost the term grand larceny, but I think that would probably be a better term for describing their activities than just shoplifting. Jobs like Benson's were a dime a dozen. One by one, the big names fell. Cartier, Kaczynski's, Graf, not to mention the wholesale diamond merchants of Hatton Garden. They had the keys to the city and they helped themselves all over town. The continent offered many more dazzling riches and policing was even more lax as the king led the charge across Western Europe. Arthur was now thinking about Europe. You could go out into the countryside and there would be small villages, small towns, which would still have master craftsmen, uh, jewellers, with, with, with uh, stores that were even more, um, you know, uh, open and, and vulnerable as they had been in England. They had a, a fistful of British visitors' passports. They were cheap cardboard passports. I would say it was quite feasible that uh, with a false passport you could go to Geneva on a flight in the morning from Heathrow, you could shoplift at lunchtime and you could be back in the afternoon. And if their description or information came in that uh, it was them, they could uh, produce their genuine original passport and say, I've never left the country. And there was nothing one could do about it really. But even the best thieves do some time. So it was for the king. He got caught in Amsterdam with a fistful of diamonds and spent a year in a Dutch jail. He had all his, uh, apparently all his meals when he was in jail in Amsterdam. They were all delivered from a local expensive restaurant or people would deliver him all. He didn't eat jail food. Delaney had a record of something over 130, 140 criminal entries during his lifetime, which is pretty exceptional for uh, any criminal. Uh, it shows that he did a lot of jail time. After his enforced sojourn in Amsterdam, Delaney returned home to Australia to regroup and indulge his other passion, beautiful women. Arthur was back from Amsterdam and uh, he was big noting all over the eastern suburbs of Sydney uh, about how well he'd done and so forth and he was, you know, um, you know cutting a sway through the ladies and he, and he met um, he met Paddy at the Rose Bay Hotel which was a local haunt um, for his crew at the time. I thought he was quite dashing, always dressed nice and had his nails polished. I hadn't met anyone who had their nails polished before. But this was a short stopover in Sydney for the King. Delaney's ambition was to be remembered as the world's greatest jewel thief, and he promised to take Patty along for the ride. He made lots of promises to lots of people, and I, and I guess she might not have taken it too seriously when he said to her, let me get there, get set up, and then I'll send you a ticket and we'll be together. And, but sure enough, it turned up. There was the air ticket. I had no desire to leave this country. Um, if it wasn't for Arthur, I don't know if I ever would. Would have, but once I did, I found it very exciting and very impressive. And it was. The Kangaroo Gang's weekly haul regularly topped £100,000. Anything not bolted down was on the shopping list. And as far as the, the money's concerned, it was astronomical. It was driving them mad. I mean, when you look back on some of the heists that they pulled, and translate into modern terms, you know, it's easy to say now they got $10,000 that day, but that's the equivalent today of over $100,000 just in an hour or so. And there was a table, a long table, it would be 10 foot long, I'd reckon. There was money on it, that eye, nearly right across it. And it was all different denominations. 
It was big. Everything was put out to take. Perfume was expensive and put out to take. They had a sense of humour. For example, they'd have a Christmas party, the shoplifters' Christmas party. So much perfume. There'd be a prize for the person who'd stole the biggest object. Crocodile belts, aquascutums, these crocodile wallets. I had so much once I gave a girl two beautiful bottles of French perfume for her 21st. These things were worth four or five hundred pounds. I look back now, I think, why'd I give it to you? A Chester Barry suit. Someone took a Volkswagen out of a showroom. Like we've got some Asprey's handbags, crocodile handbags. Usually rings, necklaces. I know that there was a beautiful onyx duct. The nice cashmere overcoats. A mink. And I got a phone call uh, late one evening to say they've pinched it. And there was a showcase there, and it had a gold up electric iron. And we knew that they were after it, and they were looking at it, but they still managed to get it. Because you've looked in the window and you've seen the size of it. Now it's in your hand. And the request was, could I get it back for them? <laughs> You're walking down the street what was in the window five minutes ago. <laughs> it, it, it's extraordinary feeling. It, it weighed almost a kilo. That was, it was a nice bit of gold, that was. No, no drug could be like that. In, in those days, Harrods had a zoo on the top floor, and apparently uh, some guy wanted a chimpanzee wasn't prepared to pay the price, and they took in a, a baby carriage, diverted the staff, wrapped the, the thing in baby clothes and wheeled it out. Yeah, good, uh, good. Now, that, 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 that is really a classic story which gets twisted from time to time. But um, I, I, I can say with a, a, a lie detector that it wasn't a chimpanzee, it was actually a cat and um, he was a Margate cat. And I had to get the cat because I owed a bookmaker big money about, about a monkey, uh, 500 pounds, not a monkey from the zoo. But, and um, it wasn't that difficult to get him because there was hardly any security. And the cat looked very lonely, and that was another reason why I thought you should come home with us. You know, he needed a mother or something. Jewellery, high-class luxury goods, the odd exotic creature, they were taking tens of thousands of pounds almost every day, hundreds of thousands in today's money. So after a hard day's graft, the villains would unwind in Europe's top night spots where they mingled with high society. With Arthur, it was just continuous. It's every night of the week. Every night of the week, we're at a nightclub or an expensive restaurant. Arthur was a great celebration man. In fact, they all were. I mean, they were living for the moment. They would uh, steal all day, drink and gamble, womanize all night. So they would be in the Colony Club or, or the Mount Club, the Victoria Sporting Club, uh, the Mayfair Club, all these glittering names, which were uh, extremely, extremely exclusive. You couldn't get in there if you were just, just a, a punter from the suburbs. You know, you had to know somebody or, or, or be accepted by the owner. So they would be in there, and, and Arthur would be playing baccarat, losing all his money, and 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 you know, shouting the bar, drinks, and all this sort of stuff, and big noting himself. And uh, and they uh, they had a great time. Let's face it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Fibs on, mate. Here's to another day in Hoister's Paradise. You betcha. If only those blokes back in Sydney could see us now. <laughs> Here, honey, take your pick. Anyone you want. Really? Anyone I want? Sure, Patty. I want to know how big you like your diamonds, sweetheart, so I know what to get you next time. I've never seen anything more beautiful. I've never seen anyone more beautiful than you. This goes perfectly. Oh, excuse me while I chunder. <laughs> you are a beautiful man, Arthur, but geez, you can lay it on. We'll have Sue getting ideas next. Well? OK, then, my love. Close your eyes. In a manner, we're as good as married. <laughs> Barry, you could be the best man. <laughs> sure, Dad. <laughs> you never change, do you, Delaney? What is it with your big brother, Cecil? Did you get all the love from Mummy, did you? You're going to get us all nicked in a mug lair like this, you know that, don't you? Oh, come on, Jimmy, he's up, would you? Try telling him that. <laughs> yes, yes, we have arrived. The party can start. <laughs> Normie, my good man, make with the DP. What's DP, Georgie? Don Perrin on you, idiot. Oh, sorry, Georgie. Of course, of course. Good as gold. Oh, g'day, girls. 
Well, bless me, but isn't gorgeous Georgie Gunn. Now, what's up, my son? And what have you got for me this week? Well, Davey, that depends on what you're paying. <laughs> Despite all the success, a bitter rivalry between the King and Wee Jimmy was becoming a public spectacle. Wee Jimmy would regard Arthur as a big noter and a loud mouth. You're going to get us all nicked in a mug lair like this, you know that, don't you? You know, you're going to bring us down one day, Arthur, but at the same time, there was a lot of, you know, competitive spirit between them, you know? Like, whatever you can do, I can do much better. So I think there was a lot of ribbing between them, a lot of, um, you know, trying to show off their wealth, show off their achievements. They'd grown up in Sydney together, they knew quite a bit together, and they'd split up and gone two different ways. So it was like Chelsea and, and, and West Ham. They'd split up and they didn't particularly like each other, but they played the same game. Because him and Jimmy used to have terrible little rows, oh. They used to start shouting at each other in the, in a bar about who's done the best bit of business and everything, in front of all sorts of people, which is not very, <laughs> you know, not very sensible, because you never know who could be around. Dave Barry was right. Someone was listening and watching. In 1967, Sergeant Mike Pierce of Criminal Intelligence at Scotland Yard was piecing together the activities of the Australians. The heyday of the kangaroo gang would soon be over. 